So my name is John Barry. I'm the chair of the Physical Sciences Department, and I help coordinate this, uh, this lecture series. So uh, tonight we have a fascinating uh, talk for you, and we're going to uh, hear all about uh, cutting-edge uh, Earth science research uh, aboard uh, an ocean-going vessel. So uh, glad you're here. Uh, uh, Naomi Barshi has a master's degree in Earth and Planetary Science from McGill University in, uh, in Montreal, Canada. And uh, boy, looking at her CV, the, the number of scholarships and awards to her credit is truly, uh, truly incredible. Uh, and I, I think you've been accepted into a PhD program starting next fall, right? I have been, yeah. yeah. Um, come find me in Madison, Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin. Great. Well, one other thing I'll tell you about Naomi, I think it was arguably the most impressive thing about your, your resume, is that she's fluent in three languages and has a working knowledge of six languages. So I thought I'd, I thought I'd ask you, do you want to give tonight's sure. talk in uh, English, Hebrew, or Swiss German? You know what? Most of my slides are in English, and my knowledge about kind of shipboard things is most efficient in English. I have told my family about um, the ship in Swiss German and in Hebrew, um, but I think probably for for our audience tonight, English will be the, okay. the lingua English, franca. English okay with everyone? <laughs> might get a lot of slang okay. in doors if you do it. Okay, you, you want Swiss German? Yeah. Okay, yo yeah. goit. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, well, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, um, Ms. Naomi Barshi. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. You already know who I am. Um, and you probably came here maybe because you were supposed to for a class, um, which is great. I hope that your classes are encouraging you to come here. But maybe you've just come here to see for yourself what we're going to talk about today. Um, and so you heard a bit about me. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough to grow up with a pretty international family. Um, and one of the other things that I've been really lucky to do uh, was sail on board this ship, the Joides Resolution, as an education and outreach officer. And I'll tell you a bit more about the presentation, but one of my kind of plugs right now is just to say, I was sailing as somebody basically doing communications things. My background is in science. And that was a really great kind of balance of science knowledge that I have. You know, I've taken a lot of geology classes, other science classes, um, but I also really enjoy writing and I really enjoy talking to people. Um, so this, the, I hope you'll see through this whole presentation that the JR, as we call it, short for Joy Dees Resolution, is really a little microcosm of what we need in the science world. We need electricians running the electrical circuits on the ship. We need technicians developing the technology we use. We need scientists to do the science. And we need people who understand the science but also understand how to communicate. So do your writing assignments. Listen to podcasts. Figure out how you enjoy communicating what you're passionate about. Good. So, so I have three really basic goals for us today. I want us to know what makes the JR so special. So I keep saying JR, that's short for Joides Resolution, the name of the ship. Um, who works on the JR? I did, but I was one of 130 people. We also have another guest here today um, in the audience who also sailed on the JR. Um, so if you have questions for a geochemist, um, hopefully he'll be happy to answer some of those. Um, and then I want to kind of wrap up, bring this back into really kind of hard-rooted in science. Um, what have we learned from this seagoing laboratory? So to answer the first two questions, I thought I'd give you guys a bit of a tour of the ship. Unfortunately, we can't all go there right now. It's off the coast of New Zealand, so it'd be a bit far for an hour-long talk. Um, but I'll take you on a bit of a tour of the ship um, and show you a couple of photos and videos from different parts of it and, um, and kind of give you a sense of who works in those different areas of the ship. Yeah, so the JR um, was actually built as an oil drilling vessel. Now we use it for science. It's part of the International Ocean Discovery Program, which this, the goal of that program is to discover more about the Earth and the oceans in the past and present through drilling into the seafloor. And we'll talk about how we can do that. So, yep, I was thinking the first thing people might notice about this is this weird looking tower on the ship called the Derrick. Um, the Derrick sits on the rig floor, so I've included those both together as kind of the same place on the ship. So, it's a wild place, um, always action happening when the, sh when the ship is drilling. Um, and the Derrick is basically just a tower 
to raise and lower the drill pipe. The drill pipe is um, made of these segments of 30 meters of pipe at a time that get strung together end to end. So to actually get to the sea floor, maybe even kilometers below the ship, you need this huge tower. And you can see here's you know, standard height person. This tower is 62 meters above. Um, I think that's actually above the water line, not the rig floor, but we'll call it about the same thing. And then at the base of the drill, so the drill string is this long kind of straw. You could think of it like for a drinking kind of straw. Um, that at the end of that long string is where the actual drill goes. And there aren't that many people here, but this is a little bit heavy, so maybe we'll just leave it up here. I actually brought um, the expedition I sailed on, gave me this as a, a kind of parting gift. So I'm very lucky to have this drill shoe, is what it's called. Um, it's kind of like a shoe in that it goes at the end of the drill string. And if you come up, you'll notice it's pretty sharp. This actually cores down through sediments. Not going to go through a really hard rock, but pretty good for, for some compacted sediments. And you can see here, uh, if even kind of more drilling is necessary, you can even have these rotating um, cones, or what they're called, even though they're not really cone-shaped, uh, that can grind down through the sediment. Great. Um, so we also see here a couple of the people who work in this part of the ship. Um, mostly these are people doing a lot of really intense manual labor, and they need to know a lot about all of the different types of um, kind of materials that they're using and all of the different machines that they use to actually put the drill string together. Um, the drill string, you might be wondering, OK, so there's this, this pipe that somehow gets to the seafloor and it's on this ship. Well, it actually goes through a hole in the middle of the ship. And this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It's called the moon pool. Um, and it might be a little bit dizzying to look at. Here is, oh, I have a pointer. Here is a ladder, so you can imagine how big this is. And um, what you're seeing here is actually a contraption to put a camera down, to put it all the way on our expedition four kilometers below the ship to reach the sea floor so that we could see the end of the drill pipe. And we needed to do that to actually go back into a hole that we had already drilled. We took the drill string out to replace this thing with that blue funky thing that you saw. And then we needed to put that all back into the hole to continue drilling with a new, um, a new drill bit. Here's the, the re-entry um, of, of the drill string into, into the seafloor. And then here, I'm showing you a picture of the controls for the drilling operations. And I'd like to show you guys two videos right now. One that kind of summarizes what we've talked about, but shows it to you in action, because it's kind of hard to imagine me just talking about it with still photos. Um, and then we'll also hear an interview with one of the drillers. The main purpose of the Joides Resolution is to drill into the ocean floor and bring up sediment cores for scientists to study. These sediment cores can give us a lot of information about the Earth. Many pieces of pipe are put together under the derrick on the rig floor into what is called a drill string. The crew attaches a drill bit to the end of the drill string and lowers the entire thing through an opening in the bottom of the ship called the moon pool. Once the drill string reaches the ocean floor, coring begins. A long cylinder of plastic called a core barrel is lowered through the drill string and the sediment cores are collected inside it as the drill string rotates. The core barrel is then pulled up to the ship through the drill pipe and onto the rig floor where the technicians and crew collect it and begin to prepare it to be examined by the scientists. And now let's hear from one of the people who actually kind of runs the drilling operation. Glenn 
Barrett. I'm a member of the drill team here on the Geordies Resolution. I'm from Sydney, Australia originally. Um, I've been on the Geordies Resolution now for just over two years, so I've had seven or eight uh, expeditions. So for us, it's not really an average day. Uh, every day is a little bit different, um, depending on the operation we're doing uh, and also the weather. Uh, that certainly affects our operations. But typically, a uh, lot of morning we'll have an operations meeting with the crew and discuss um, what we're going to be doing that day uh, and in subsequent days. And uh, we'll also discuss safety aspects uh, that go along with those tasks. So the biggest challenge is the weather. Um, we, are, we are floating, so uh, with tide and swell and um, and wind and rain, the ship moves around a lot. Uh, at times we're trying to do very precise work. Um, it's sometimes four or five kilometres beneath the rig. So if the rig's moving, that can uh, that can certainly impact our operations. So that's probably the hardest aspect: the weather. Uh, my favourite parts of the people. Every uh, every expedition we sail on is a is a new team of scientists on board, uh, looking to achieve uh, and investigate different things and different goals from the previous uh, the previous expedition. So new people from new countries, new cultures, um, and every time we crew change, we're usually in a different port. So the travel is exciting. Part of that The, uh, the big weather you can get down in the Southern Ocean. Uh, we had an expedition south of South Africa, south of Cape Town, and we had you know, 10 to 15 metre seas, you know, up, sort of up to 50 feet for those Americans who are watching. Um, and the frequency with which those waves were coming through was quite scary. So, yeah, that was uh, certainly an aspect I, I hadn't encountered and hadn't experienced before. So let's return to the ship um, and go back to our tour um, and see kind of where most of the scientists spend most of their time, uh, most of their waking hours. And you know, as we said, the whole purpose of the ship is to drill down into the seafloor and get these um, long tubes of sediment. Um, hopefully, uh, there will be kind of coherent cores of sediment that we can then um, open up and look at in the lab, and the core deck is where all of that happens. The main kind of things that happen on the core deck are we look at the core. Here are some examples of it laid out on the sampling table. So um, this is Freya, a paleontologist. She's poking little tube things into the, the cores, which at this, in this core are kind of squishy sediments, so you can basically scrape them with a toothpick and get some sediment off on the toothpick. So they're not yet rock. This was our definition of what's a rock. Can you scrape it with a toothpick? Yes, it's not a rock yet. Um, so she's going to take that back into her lab, look at it under a microscope, and identify some maybe micro fossils, so things that, are, um, that you need a microscope to look at uh, that might be about the width of your hair. And then maybe inside some of those micro fossils, there might be even tinier fossils. And those would be nano fossils. So this is a view of what's inside this little radiolarian hole um, actually is full of little nanofossils. So there are people on board who that's their job. In real time, they can look at these sediments as they come out of the, out of the seafloor onto the ship. And using these fossils, we can talk about this more if you guys want to know more about it, but they can tell the age of the sediment um, within a couple million years, um, but good enough to, to kind of give us a sense of what's going on. Um, some other people who work on the core deck are technicians. Um, that's where they spend a lot of their time as well. And uh, they might be you know, moving core around the lab, um, bringing it out from when it comes onto the ship, cutting it up um, into sizable chunks that we can carry around the lab, opening it up into halves so that we can actually look inside and see what the core is made out of. But then also designing and building instruments to measure physical properties of the core. So up here, this is the schmizzle, um, the section half, so half a section of core, 
multi-sensor logger. So as this goes through, it measures several different aspects of the core all at once. Um, I'm sorry, that is incorrect. <laughs> this is not the schmizzle. The schmizzle looks just like this. This actually just measure li measures light reflections. But anyway, the schmizzle looks just like it. Um, and this is something that was designed and built for this ship. It can deal with being moving all the time, like everything is on the ship all the time. Um, so that's pretty exciting. So um, yep, describing cores. And then this says sample for shipboard and home. So shipboard analyses that kind of like Freya might be doing at the microscope, but then also scientists want to take samples back with them to the lab to do other types of analyses that they can't do on board. Maybe it's a type of instrument that can't deal with moving all the time or it's too big to be on the ship. So next, let's go to the bridge. This is where the main navigation of the ship happens. And just upstairs from the core deck is kind of the front of the ship. This was the captain on our cruise. Um, and while the ship is moving, this is probably a pretty exciting place to be. Um, lots of people looking out through the windows, using the radar screens, satellite, other types of communication. But while the ship is still and in place over one site, and it might be there, in our case, we stayed for about a month over one site because we were drilling a really deep hole. Um, when the ship is in place, it's not really all that exciting to be up here. Nothing's really happening right here in kind of the view out area. The exciting place to be is in the dynamic positioning room, which is right behind the main part of the bridge. And maybe you're wondering, OK, so I understand that there's this ship. There's this drill string below it. Somewhere four kilometers below the ship, that hits the seafloor. Then somehow it kind of drills into the seafloor. I get it. The cores are coming back up through that. They come onto the ship, which, by the way, might take several hours um, between each core. But the ship needs to stay exactly in place over that hole four kilometers below the ship. And uh, this is all run through satellites and GPS um, and these cool things called thrusters. So stationed all around the ship are giant engines. They're basically um, like train engines uh, that actually run on the electricity of the ship. And they um, kind of push the water out to keep the ship in place. So this one moves a little bit. If the ship is kind of tilting this way, this one's going to move it up. But then if it tilts too much, these ones in the back are going to move it up again. So the ship is very stable while it's in place. And I wanted to show you a picture of these thrusters. So here they are. Here are some people for scale. And this is the thruster when it's up. So when the ship is in motion, in transit, um, then they stay up. And then when we need them to keep the ship in place, um, they slowly move down. And, um, and then are kind of firing in the water in place. So how do they run? Oh my goodness, it requires a lot of power. So here is the engine control room. So again, thinking about who works on the JR. There are engineers who run all the engine controls. There are electricians who make sure all the electrical circuits all through the ship are always working. There are people who are working back in the trash incinerator, uh, which I didn't actually bring you pictures of today. Um, but there are people doing any kind of job on this ship. An engine is pretty big. Um, I covered this up a bit, so it's hard to tell how big the, this is, but this is like a, a floor tile. Um, so they're pretty big locomotive engines, and then the inner workings of the ship are vast. Um, this is one of our friends. She's like 6'2", so a bit of an above average scale for the photo. Um, and there are lots of different pipes connecting everything. I don't know how all that works, but the engineers do. And um, while we're here, you might also be wondering, what kind of water do you drink when you're at sea for two months? And also, don't the engines get really hot? Yes, and these questions are related, because one of the ways that they actually make drinking water for the ship is by cooling the engines with seawater, collecting the evaporated water, recondensing that, mixing it with some minerals so that it's nicer to drink, and then that becomes part of the drinking water for the ship. So it's a pretty cool little internal um, kind of floating island. 
on our expedition, we were 300 kilometers away from the nearest land. And that was not as far from land as the ship has been. So let's move now to kind of the daily life side. Um, when you're at sea for two months, you get pretty used to your routine. Everybody works on 12 hour shifts. So I was on the midnight to noon shift and um, there were half of the scientists on my shift and the other half of the scientists were on the other shift. Um, half the electricians work on one shift and the other half work on the other shift. So there are always people switching over, which also means, so there's a noon to midnight shift, midnight to noon shift, those are the 12-12 shifts, and then there are two 6-6 shifts. So there's a 6-6 six, six days and 6-6 six, six nights, and there kind of is almost always a counterpart on each shift. So there's food every six hours, <laughs> and, um, and then snack times every three hours between the six hour food times. So um, if you're hungry, you can always eat, which I found was the only solution to my seasickness. I got extremely seasick, but if I wasn't hungry, I was fine. Um, so here are a few pictures from kind of the food side of things. Uh, a typical lineup for any meal would have any aspect, breakfast for some people, dinner for some people, lunch for others. Um, on Sundays, they did a barbecue. It was one of the few ways that we knew it was a Sunday because it's two months, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, no weekends. Um, but there were a couple of special days, superhero Saturdays and barbecue Sundays. Um, here's a picture of some of the scientists who were on board our expedition. Uh, somebody was asking earlier about a, somebody who studies ash deposits. Um, so this is Stefan, he studies ash deposits. Um, Tamara, she was our scale earlier. Uh, she studies earthquakes. Um, Andre, he's a geochemist. And um, Abby uh, studies what happens to rocks when you squeeze them really fast. Um, so, you know, intergenerational, international. Uh, actually, we have very few nations represented in this photo. Stefan and Andre are both from Germany, and Tamara and Abby are both from the US. Um, but we had people from 13 different countries just in the science party on our expedition. Um, and sometimes they, well, they always tried really hard to make us great food. Sometimes it looked beautiful and didn't taste as beautifully. <laughs> All right, after 12 hours of work, you might be kind of tired, ready for your 12 hours off, which may sound like a long time, but it disappears quickly into eating after your shift, waking up and eating before your next shift, somehow sleeping, using the very limited internet, satellite internet time that you get to contact some family back home. Um, so let's see kind of a typical cabin and other necessities. So everybody shares a cabin, except the really top people. Um, the co-chief scientists and the captain of the ship don't actually share a cabin, but everybody else shares a cabin with somebody on the opposite shift. So it's like you have kind of a ghost roommate. You're never really in the room at the same time, um, but you're not in the same bed. In some places, it's kind of a warm bed uh, style <laughs> that you actually share the same bed. Very efficient, not the style in the JR. Um, things are actually very comfortable. Uh, one of the best showers I've ever taken on the JR, you get really good water control and the water pressure is excellent. Um, and uh, yep, you know, everybody needs it. And uh, there's a special system set up um, with vacuum flush kind of like in, on an airplane and special toilet paper made just for the ship. Not for the ship, but kind of just for seagoing, seagoing systems. Great, and we also want to do some things for fun. Um, people work really hard which is great, that's how we get some of the amazing science that I'll tell you about soon. Um, but it's also nice to have a place to deal with some of that food and built up energy that you have. Um, people also go for walks around on the heli deck. Uh, we had a JR's Got Talent kind of fun thing. We had a good time. And then there's also a movie theater slash workout room. Uh, sometimes people watch workout videos in there. and You know, build camaraderie, build some muscles, good things to do. All right, so that kind of sums up our tour of the ship. Um, I also wanted to watch yet another video just to see that a bit more in action, wake you up again, um, and hear from lots of different people who've worked on the ship. Some of them for a short time, like for a couple months or a couple years, and some people for a really long time. Uh, we'll hear from somebody in this video who, at the time the video was made, had worked on the, um, with the 
program, which has had many names in the past, but basically with this ocean drilling program um, for 30 something years, I think. We'll see, and the video was made in 2014. And I recognize all the people on it. So um, they've been sailing for yet another almost four years since then. It's, it's a really well-made video. It's really neat. Pay attention to kind of what the people are saying, how that's related to what you're seeing in the images. Um, how kind of the pacing of the, the little video, it's only four and a half minutes, but it conveys a lot um, through all those different, different ways of conveying the information. The most interesting thing about sailing on this ship is it's always some new thing to investigate or some new problem to help surmount. There's always new people to meet. The scientists are universally a very smart bunch of people and they're always interesting because it's an international group. It's a people watcher's paradise. Core on deck, core on deck. When spending about four months each year at sea, you essentially live two lives. The life for a technician working for the International Ocean Discovery Program on board the drill ship Joides Resolution involves hard hats, safety glasses, and the willingness to get pretty grubby. Call me a mud monkey for nothing. Without technicians on board to keep instruments running, data organized, samples archived, and scientists productive, this respected scientific drilling program could not have been as successful. I feel that we have a, a very important role in the, this program because it's carried on for so many years. We're sort of the stewards and carry on this legacy of quality science so that you can compare something now to something from a decade ago or two decades or three uh, because the same types of processes are being used. That's something that you're not going to see in any science program. You know, we even document it in our books of you know, those who've come before us. And I like that feeling that there's a real history here. We have to really pull together and really work as a team being isolated out here and troubleshooting problems. Being on a ship with people for 60 days, you become a lot closer to those people uh, than you would in a normal work environment. Many technicians have science backgrounds, but to fit into these seagoing roles, ideally the individual should be consistent, malleable, observant, flexible, have to go with the flow, and have a good sense of humor about things. Because when you're this close with everybody, you're going to rub shoulders. You're going to rub somebody wrong. So I started in 1977. Our only computing device was essentially a programmable calculator. It had the little magnetic strips. So now we have Facebook and email. I started as a storekeeper, which is the person who does all the paperwork, getting things on and off the ship. Tim Brunk is now an assistant lab officer, but the various hats worn during his 60-plus expeditions put him in Thin Section Lab, Formation Microscan Operator, in the Downhole Tools Lab, and the Chemistry Lab. All the science out here is interesting because it all goes together. I, th I like that part of seeing each data set come in and then seeing how it all fits into one piece and tells a story. <laughs> the hardest part is waking up to an alarm clock every single day <laughs> for the same schedule every single day. It's not all science all the time. There's special days to celebrate, morale to boost, music to play. My cat loves that one because it's like a high pitch, so she like rubbing it. Anything to keep people on an even keel. You gotta be careful about this food, you know. Yeah. To the gym and fit in your pants when you leave. I love birthdays out here. It's almost like being a kid again. Everybody signs a card. Everybody comes and has cake and sings you happy birthday. Turned 50 years old out here. I've done the math, but some, I can't be 50. The presence I got was a remote control inflatable shark. And I think that was the most fun anybody's had out here in a while. Well, the hardest part is being away from home when something happens back there and people need you. And you're here. We go all over the world. I don't know how many countries I've been to, 30, 40 countries, and you know, not, not many jobs let you do that. When you're at home, how often do you see a sunrise? Out here you can see two months worth of sunrises. There's just something about the day beginning with the sunrise and the sun sets, everything kind of either mellows out or gets crazy.
Cool. <laughs> they don't party every night. <laughs> um, it's also a dry ship, um, which makes a lot of sense if you're at sea for two months. I want everybody to be capable of work every single day for 12 hours. Um, but it is fun to you know, let loose. And as you saw, the, the movie room there is equipped pretty well. Gyms are very well equipped, too. So um, Good. So I hope that gave you a bit more of a sense of kind of all the different, well, some of the different 130 or so people who sail on an expedition together. Um, and I uh, got to see lots of different parts of the ship, lots of different jobs that people do. In one of those scenes, um, I forgot to tell you about the core deck. Not only are people designing the, uh, kind of technically designing and engineering the equipment, um, but there are also computer programmers that design the software that runs the analyses that those instruments do. So um, kind of everything that, that you could imagine. OK, so I hope by now we can answer some of these questions of what makes the JR special and who works on the JR. So I'd like to tell you a bit about some of the science that has come out of this um, long project. The JR has been sailing since the late 80s, um, so about as long as I've been sailing the world. Um, and uh, the Ocean Discovery Program, or I guess I should say the International Ocean Discovery Program is what it's now called. It's the international government-funded program that, um, that runs this kind of science. Before that, it had another name. It was the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. Before that, it had another name. It was the Ocean Di Discovery Program, the Ocean Drilling Program. Before that, it was the Deep Sea Drilling Project. So we have been drilling into the seafloor for science since really the 50s with this kind of program since the 60s. And I promised for your geography professor, I have a map. Here is our map. Um, it's of the whole world, so it includes everything. Um, but all the dots here are places that the, some version of this scientific drilling program has been um, since the late 60s. So not a lot of places missing. And this goes through 2019, um, at least in terms of planned expeditions. So our expedition is this, uh, probably the, one of the blue dots over here. And um, right now, the ship is over here off coast of New Zealand, learning about some really wonky earthquakes that happen there. They're slow. They're not like the fast earthquakes that maybe we've experienced here. Um, they're really big magnitude earthquakes. But imagine it as kind of a slow rumble over maybe days or weeks instead of a couple seconds of fast shaking. Um, so they're trying to understand what those actually are, how they happen. Um, great. And the JR, as I mentioned, hasn't drilled all of these. Some of these have been drilled by other ships, like the one that belongs to Japan. That's kind of the sister ship to the Joides Resolution, the Chikyu. And then Europe also runs um, a drilling program that's part of IODP. And they rent out specific types of drilling platforms. Maybe it's a ship. Maybe it's something that kind of goes and plops in one place that's, that doesn't really look like a ship. Um, but a different type of drilling platform, depending on what's needed for that expedition. So we have learned a lot from ocean drilling. The JR was actually one of the reasons that we even know plate tectonics happens. Who's talked about plate tectonics in some class at some point? Hopefully everybody, right? It's how the kind of rigid outer layer of our Earth works, how those big chunks of crust, uh, ocean or continental crust, how those are interacting with each other. Um, that's what I'm curious to know more about and what I'm going to be doing next um, in my research work. Um, the JR is one of the reasons we know that seafloor spreading happens. We've drilled through the ocean floor and recognized patterns in the ocean floor that I'm happy to tell you more about that tell us that actually plates are pulling apart in some places. Um, the expedition I was on and the expedition right now are trying to understand subduction, so places where plates are diving underneath a different plate. And in those places where plates interact, when you get stressed, maybe you feel like you're about to break. Oh, that's exactly what happens in an earthquake. So we're also learning more about earthquakes and earthquake mechanisms through the JR. And then I have an example here. Um, this is a figure from one of the papers that was written in a peer-reviewed journal as a result of some of the work on the expedition I sailed on. Um, and we were drilling. so. Um, let's look at this top figure because this is zero million years ago. That's today. Um, this is the Indian subcontinent. The Himalaya are here. And we were drilling here off coast of 
the island of Sumatra. And when we scraped a little toothpick into those sediments before they were rocks um, and looked at them under microscopes, we saw minerals that belong to the kinds of rocks we find on, find on continents, not the kind of rocks that really just form in place in the ocean floor. And they weren't made of lots of different fossils. They were really made of tiny, tiny parts of mountains. So we said, wow, there are no mountains close to us now that could generate that sediment except the Himalaya. All these tiny, tiny, smaller than sand and sand-sized minerals that we found in the seafloor actually floated and were, or really were carried by these underwater rivers um, thousands of kilometers away from the mountains. And we found out stuff about the evolution of that mountain belt that we couldn't find by going to the mountains. Because now, the history that we see in those mountains doesn't record the past 10 million years. It records an older history. But to find everything that's been eroded off the top of those mountains, which isn't in the mountains anymore, we have to go down to the ocean to find it, because that's where it has flowed out to. So we were actually able to find that by drilling into these sediments, we could learn about how the whole Indian subcontinent has moved over the past, say, 12 million years. So here's a snapshot 12 million years ago. You can see the Indian subcontinent is out here and continues to smash into the Eurasian continent as we go from 12 million years ago, about 9 million years ago, to today. We also have learned about the history of life by drilling into seafloor sediments. Um, there's a lot of life in the oceans. And a lot of it is really small. And it sinks to the seafloor and collects there. So if you're drilling through it, it's almost like bringing up these little time capsules of previous times in Earth history. So here again is actually a figure from our expedition. And this is what cores really look like. They can look so different. So Here's a section about one and a half meters long of um, probably more, uh, I guess, carbonate type sediments. Layered sands and really fine clays. Um, ooh, this is the giraffe looking core. Gosh, I don't remember what it was made out of. <laughs> we can talk about it now. It's been a year since the expedition, so everything is open access. You can go and find these photos online. You can go get the data and make what you will out of it. Um, it is yours. In fact, you funded it. So you should have access to it. Um, and you do. Uh, and then, um, so we'll ignore what the cores are made out of for the moment. We can talk about that later. Um, but uh, within some of those cores, the ones that have those little fossils in them, you might fossil, find fossils made out of um, silica, basically glass. and. As I was mentioning earlier, you can find out about how old those sediments are. But we know that certain types of those little organisms prefer warm water or cold water. So if we find those little organisms that like warm water, what do you think about climate at that time that those were deposited? It was a warmer time, right? So we can not only find out about kind of the fossil record in high resolution, right? Because we're looking at a kilometer and a half of sediment. So any one centimeter, well, it might represent a million years if it's very slow sedimentation rate, or it might represent a day if it's very fast sedimentation rate. We might find out about extinctions when life died. Um, an expedition around the same time as ours um, had actually drilled through the impact crater from the giant space rock that hit the Earth and around the same time all the dinosaurs died, we think it's probably related, would have caused a lot of climate change and um, really uninhabitable conditions for basically everything bigger than a golden retriever. Um, and actually afterwards, if you guys want to come and take a look, um, we have a section of core that actually records that time. So right about 65.5 million years ago. It's recorded in this little bit of core. Um, and then we can also find out about climate. So we might want to know about the recent history of climate. We might want to know about old history of climate. So I've put up a figure here 
um, from another recent uh, IODP expedition that we can measure in sediments the different masses of oxygen. It has a couple of different masses that it can have. We compare the different heavier mass oxygen atoms to some lighter mass oxygen atoms, and that can tell us a bit about the conditions um, that were kind of happening when those sediments were deposited with the water that had those um, oxygen isotopes or whatever it is that you're measuring them in. And I won't go into why exactly, but we can tell things like whether the ocean was a bit more salty. If we have more heavy isotopes, those are kind of left behind as water evaporates. So we can imagine, wow, that water is probably more salty because salt is also left behind when the water evaporates. So that's what this lower graph is showing you is actually the salinity. Today, and going back 350,000 years into the past. And that's all from these measurements that we can make from these types of cores. I've mentioned this a couple times already. Another thing that we've learned kind of outside of the primary science is also in the world of technology. And we've developed these really cool instruments that can go on a ship. And um, it's actually really convenient that we're very still right now and that you can sit still. It's very easy to weigh something if you're sitting still. But if everything's always moving all the time, you've been on a roller coaster, right? You feel lighter at the top and you feel heavier at the bottom. <laughs> so you've got to either wait a while or figure out exactly the curve of the wave of the ship and then calculate the actual mass from that. Um, and then we can also, instead of just measuring things on the cores that are on the ship, we can send instruments into the hole that we've drilled and measure things that way. So there's a wealth of technologies that have been developed around kind of ocean drilling, um, especially around the JR. Well, um, I'll turn it over to you now for questions. Um, I do want to tell you that you can keep up with the JR. The ship is always at sea, almost always on an expedition, um, but there are usually people posting things on Facebook, posting things on Twitter, posting things on Instagram, um, making videos like the ones that we saw in the presentation. Those are all on the JR YouTube channel, if you just look for Joydee's resolution. It's the only one. Um, and then the ship also has its own website that hosts blogs and all kinds of multimedia information. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when, if it's been scheduled yet, but keep an eye out. The JR usually doesn't ask me anything on Reddit on pretty much every expedition. So if you have some more questions that we don't get to tonight, or you want to ask the people who are actually sailing on the current expedition, keep an eye out for, for an AMA um, Ask Me Anything event on Reddit. What's the worst thing that happens has happened to this drill pipe? Um, would it be possible for some kind of whale or something to hit it? Um, my answer about the whale is a statistical answer. Like The drill pipe is about this big around. And the, sh the ocean is a lot bigger. <laughs> um, so it's unlikely. The, the ship is also noisy um, and makes a lot of kind of eddies in the water. And like, if I were hearing that or feeling that, I wouldn't get too close. Um, probably the worst thing, uh, I think that at some point the drill string did break. And they had to abandon the part that broke off under the ship because there isn't really a way to recover that. Um, so of course that is you know, very unfortunate, costs time, costs money. You have to bring whatever is left of the drill string back up, put it back together, send it back down, maybe start a new hole. Um, so those things do happen. Yep. Yeah. I, I was curious in, in, in terms of the actual drilling technology, mm -hmm. are you using mud to drill? Yeah, are you, so. Are you lubricating? The... Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is drilling mud. Um, Aboard, I don't know exactly what all is mixed in there, but um, something to kind of lubricate the whole system, keep it cool, um, keep it moving smoothly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you're right, there is this, we call it a re entry funnel, or a, I guess it's actually not a re entry cone, it's a free fall funnel. Anyway, it looks like a funnel and it helps the drill go back in. So when the drill pipe is inside the hole, if you put something down around the drill pipe, it will end at the hole. And then, once it's in, you can take the drill pipe out again 
fix the bit or change it or whatever you need to do, and then put that back down in through that reentry funnel, which may take a long time. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that we can't actually see here that was in your question was that for some holes, you can put down a metal casing um, that kind of follows the drill. You can drill without coring and have a casing follow the drill down and then pull the drill out, and that casing can hold open the walls of the hole, which we actually did on our expedition so that we could, we just drilled through. We knew what we were going through already because we had cored that same section. We moved over a couple meters and then drilled a new hole, cased that, and then started coring again, so actually collecting the samples that we were samples of the rocks that we were drilling through um, after going through that, that metal casing to keep the, kind of keep the sand from falling in on itself. Yeah. When we um, drill down, we advance 10 meters at a time. So if we get full recovery, you get basically almost 10 meters of sediments in that long plastic tube that you saw the people carrying. Um, so full recovery is about 10 meters per advance. Then, to actually be able to move that around inside, you cut it into one and a half meter sections. Oh, okay. Yeah. We drilled a kilometer and a half below the seafloor, um, which is one of the deeper holes that IODP has drilled. Um, do you remember the deepest hole that they've drilled? I know I saw the stats on this just the other day, but maybe two kilometers, something like that. Yeah, yeah, so I guess, I mean, part of it is, Part of the limit is how much pipe do you have on board that you can put end to end um, to actually reach the seafloor, which also depends on like the depth of the ocean. So if you're in really shallow water, you can drill a deeper hole. Um, we were in 4.2 kilometers of water with a 1.5 kilometer deep hole. So we had one of the longest drill strings. Um, but then, yeah, you also have to deal with the, with the sediments once they come back on board. They absolutely are cataloged very carefully. Um, there's a curator on every ship that their job is basically to, or on every expedition on the ship, their job is basically to make sure that everything is kept very orderly. And um, when I showed you pictures from the core deck, um, so you can see here, this, is, this looks flat because it's a flat cut through uh, the core. So this is only half the core that's sitting here. The other half never gets sampled. It's only for description and it becomes an archive. So um, the rest of this core currently lives in Japan because we were in the Indian Ocean, so that's part of kind of the Asia region. So all those cores go to live in Japan. Um, if they'd been drilled in um, the Mediterranean, they would go to Germany. If they'd been drilled um, maybe offshore here, they'd probably go to Texas. Uh, those are the core repositories. And if you want to do a research project and you want some cores from the JR, you can submit a request and they'll hopefully say yes to your request and you would be able to get a sample from this working half of the core. And if you wanted a sample right here, too bad, that's already been sampled. <laughs> um, but if you want a sample right here, great, you can get that. And if you wanted to go describe the archive half, that's always there kind of for you for the future. Yeah. yeah. I have a couple questions. Okay. Um, one question is, can you tell us a little bit about how you, you, you seized this amazing opportunity? Sure, And yeah. then kind of as a follow-up question, could you maybe offer some words of wisdom for the students here about how to pursue uh, incredible opportunities like this one yeah. as a student absolutely. yourself? Yep, absolutely. So um, I was lucky. I knew somebody who had this job before I had it, so I heard about it. Um, you too are lucky. You've gotten to hear this presentation. Um, and I'm happy also, I should have put my contact info on here, but um, I'm happy to answer questions also after tonight about this. Um, I had also worked as an undergrad doing some research in a lab, processing samples that had been drilled by the JR. Um, so I knew that the ship existed, and then once I went to grad school, um, and a friend had, had done the program, uh, the outreach officer program before me. Um, you apply online, and Words of wisdom, I guess, about all of these things. Apply for stuff. Mm -hmm. If it is free, this application is free, excellent. If it costs some money to apply for things, think about it a little bit more. But really, just apply for stuff, because you won't get the job if you don't apply for it. And 
Um, actually, how I'm here tonight is also one of these things. So I moved here, was looking for a job, thought, well, I enjoy teaching. I have a master's. I can teach in community college. Theoretically, with those qualifications, let's see if any community colleges need somebody. Oh, there's an open position for an adjunct instructor slash substitute. OK, so they might call if they ever need somebody. Well, I'll apply. And then I'll email the head of the department and see if they will actually see my application, if they really have any openings. Great. No openings right now, but hey, do you want to come give a talk? Sure, absolutely. So I would say just, just go for things. Keep getting those cool experiences, and then you'll have something to show like, oh, yeah, I have done one of these things. And maybe if you know somebody who works in something that you're interested in, maybe it's one of your professors. They know people who are doing all kinds of cool stuff. They're probably doing really cool things too, actually. Um, so get your hands into something, even if you don't like it. That's fine. Then don't do it again. <laughs> do something else the next time. Um, but have those experiences. Yeah. So yeah, those pipes go up into the derrick. Um, and then either they go uh, kind of from the, the stack of pipe up into the derrick and then down into the rest of the drill string. And they get connected by this machine on the drill floor. Or the other way around, if they're in the drill string, they get disconnected by that machine on the drill floor up into the derrick, and then they lie down back into the, to the big, big, big stack of pipes. Yeah, anyway, the PNS waves, um, we use these different types of waves that travel through materials to know more about them. Um, you might do this if you're like, oh, is this glass or mm, uh, particle board? Um, but we can do that to kind of try to image what's on the subsurface of the Earth. And then while we're taking cores of the subsurface, we want to actually measure what those, um, how those sound waves travel through the material so that we can, you know, if, if you've ever seen or heard of seismic lines, a lot of oil companies, seismic data to try to tell where there's an oil reservoir. Um, but you don't actually know whether a sound wave velocity of 3,000 meters per second is really a sandstone until you've sampled that sandstone. So we can sample the sandstone and then measure the P wave velocity, and then we can learn more about what those seismic profiles really actually mean in the real world. We were really lucky with all our weather, um, despite that I got seasick a lot, but we were actually really lucky with the weather. Um, uh, sometimes, I mean, this gets back to your question about what is kind of the worst thing that can happen with a drill string. Um, I think it was in really bad weather that actually the drill string broke because it was too much bend on it. Um, so then it's up to kind of the captain and the operations crew to decide, okay, is this weather so bad that we should pull up the drill string? Mm -hmm. Is this weather so bad that we should leave? In which case, you need to either pull up the drill string or abandon the drill pipe. Um, is this weather so bad that we should abandon ship? Right, that's the most extreme case. So. Um, that's probably never happened. I, I heard a story. There are many stories <laughs> on the ship um, that they did once consider um, abandoning the ship because the weather was quite so bad. But, um, but they didn't. They stayed on, and, and everything was fine in the end. I think they needed to replace some windows. But. We actually we saw a fair amount of wildlife. We saw, I think I may have seen a squid. It was so fast that I don't know what it was. Uh, but we saw lots of mahi-mahi. Uh, and sometimes um, flying fish, and some dolphins when we were in transit. Um, while we were moving, they liked to kind of play in the, in the wake and in the, um, like in the weird waves that are created by the front of the ship as it's moving through the water. Um, so that was fun. Lots of seabirds. Um, yeah. Different expeditions have different goals. So I've told you about two expeditions that had kind of tectonics goals, um, but some of them want to know, so we wanted to know a lot about the sediments, but we did want to capture the top 10 meters of the basalt ocean crust, so kind of the, the rock that cooled from lava or magma on the seafloor that all the sediments sit on top of. Um, so yeah, there was an expedition that my friend was on um, that I heard about a couple years ago now. Um, they were trying to drill through the entire ocean crust to try to see the top of the mantle. They didn't quite get there. It's a technologically very difficult problem. But that's an example also of a type of hole that they would be able to go back because um, it's in rock. So it has a better chance of staying open than our 
holes in sand. <laughs> um, and they, they'll hopefully be able to, to keep drilling and find out what's. Yeah, I submit your proposal. You know, I'd like to do kind of these projects with the sediments. Um, and then the co-chiefs who put in the whole proposal, you know, we want to go to this site to drill it, they look through that and they say, oh, we need somebody to fill this position. Hey, this person wants to do this. That, you know, fits well with what other people want to do. So then they, you know, kind of reach into that pool and decide, you know, how to get a wide range, get the most information, you know, from doing this as they can. So what did you research specifically? Yeah, so I was the organic geochemist on board, um, so part of it's safety related, you know, we don't want to hit oil, we don't want to hit, you know, methane, have a gas blowout, so part of my work was to make sure uh, we weren't in any danger of that. And then another part was looking at, you know, there's a very tiny amount of organic matter actually in the seafloor mud, so, you know, little bits of the plankton that were alive that sink down, a little bit of that uh, remains. So I was looking at that on the ship and now um, in the lab here actually I, I just sent off a whole crate of tiny little samples um, for, for analysis and hopefully they'll tell us about the climate in, you know, we saw kind of the India Himalayan drainage so it's these uh, isotope markers, basically how heavy this carbon molecule is. And, you know, if we can see that change through time, um, we think the whole area got a lot more arid. And so we should be able to tell from, you know, what's in the sediment, the plant matter that's gone thousands of kilometers that's in the sediment now, you know, will be able to tell us it got a lot drier around this time period. Um, so I'm I'm perpetually amazed by what you can learn about the earth as a whole by looking at, you know, the marine sediment. So what was, you know, the temperature, what were the seasons like in India? Hey, let's go off Sumatra. Let's drill a hole in the sea floor, you know, and we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, so yeah, that's broadly what I'm looking mm -hmm. at. Maybe, I think it's actually probably more specialized than Maybe you're thinking there are 30 or so scientists on every expedition, so think 15 on one shift, 15 on the other shift. Um, usually one or two education people. Um, and then another 100 other people. <laughs> um, so uh, 30 or so of those people, again, are kind of the technicians. Um, and those are the people that would be a little bit less tied to any proposal. They would be doing, you know, making thin sections or coding the software. Um, and then for a proposal, kind of for the science party, um, yes, I mean, you should be able to do all the different types of work that, you know, for example, a geochemist needs to measure the, the gas geochemistry, but also needs to have kind of a cool project to do back home related to whatever those sediments might bring up. Um, the paleontologists will need to be able to identify foraminifera, little single-celled carbonate organisms, or Radiolarians, little single-celled sil uh, they're silica, they're silica organisms. Um, diatoms, little silica single-celled organisms that are different from radiolarians. Um, but then would also need to be doing something like, what was the climate like? What is the diversity of these organisms like in the past? And then, I mean, in some ways the work is also kind of repetitive. So if you're measuring gas geochemistry, you don't just do that once. You do it every time a core comes up. So if you're in shallow water drilling shallow, or many shallow holes, that might be every hour. Um, if you're in deep water, nearing the one and a half kilometer depth of the hole, so nearing you know, five kilometers, five and a half kilometers below the ship, it might take four hours between every core, um, but you're still doing that every single time that the core comes up. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, we should probably call it a night. It's been been a really good time talking to all of you and hearing your many questions, so thank you for that. And um, yeah, thanks. Okay,